fasting to me is probably one of the most, if not the most important thing one can do as one gets older to improve how you age. Hi, everyone. Drew Prote here, host of the Broken Brain Podcast. Today, we're talking about aging well. Regardless of what age you are, if you're listening to this health podcast or any others, you want to live a healthy and happy life. And Dr. Frank Lippman, today's guest, is going to teach us exactly how. There's going to be some things that surprise you. Stay tuned for our conversation. It's a fascinating one. This episode of the podcast is brought to you by Bio Optimizers. So one of the reasons... Of course, I started this podcast because I love helping people learn how to optimize their health. And many people are okay feeling just okay day to day, but with a few simple changes, you can feel freaking amazing instead. And why wouldn't you want to? Diet and lifestyle, super important, and those are the foundation. And certain supplements can also be really helpful. Because even if you're eating 100% organic, we know that our soil just does not have the same nutrient quality it did 100 years ago. So one of the key nutrients that's missing often from our soil and definitely in people's diets is magnesium. Most of our soil has become depleted of magnesium. So it's a tough mineral to get just through diet alone and 80% of Americans are actually deficient in it. But here's the thing, it's crucial for hundreds of reactions, almost 400 different reactions in the body, and it impacts everything from metabolism to sleep, neurological health, energy, pain, muscle function, stress response, and so many other essential areas of health. So here's the kicker. I recently found a magnesium supplement I love from a company called Bio Optimizers. Their magnesium breakthrough formula contains seven different forms, which have all different functions in the body. Shout out to my brother-in-law, Dr. Neil Patel, who was the first person that told me about Bio-Optimizer's magnesium. There is truly nothing like it on the market. I really noticed a difference in my sleep, and I've been handing it out to my friends and family who also have issues when it comes to stress levels or managing their sleep. All of Bio-Optimizer's products are soy-free, gluten-free, lactose-free, non-GMO, free of chemicals and fillers, and made with all natural ingredients. I love that they give back to their community too. For every 10 bottles they sold, they donate one to someone in need. Right now, you can get BioOptimizers Magnesium Breakthrough for 10% off. Just go to BioOptimizers backslash brain. That's BioOptimizers, B-I-O-P-T-I-M-I-Z-E-R-S dot com slash brain and use code BRAIN10 and you'll get 10% off this extremely helpful magnesium formula. I think you're going to love it as much as I do. Now back to today's episode. Welcome to the Broken Brain Podcast. I'm your host, Drew Perowit, and each week my team and I bring on a new guest who we think can help improve your brain health, feel better, and most importantly, live more. This week's guest is a dear friend of mine, Dr. Frank Lippman. Dr. Lippman is recognized as a vocal pioneer of integrative and functional medicine, or what he calls good medicine. I love that, by the way. Dr. Lippman is the founder of the 1111 Wellness Center in New York City and the chief medical officer at The Well. He's written six best-selling books, and today we're talking about his latest one, The New Rules of Aging Well, a simple program for immune resilience, strength, and vitality. Frank, welcome to the Broken Brain Podcast. Thank you for having me, and it's great to speak to you again. It is great. I mean, really, I want to just start off with some gratitude because um, when I first got into the world of understanding and learning about functional medicine, you were one of the first people that I connected with in person and got a chance to connect to. And you were so uh, gracious to uh, meet with me at your 1111 Wellness Center in New York City, talk about your world, how you practice, how you see things. And uh, you really opened up my eyes to a whole new world that I didn't know had existed yet. So I just want to start off by saying thank you for playing such a role in my journey. Um, it's been immense uh, what you what knowledge you kicked me off with. And, and back to you with the gratitude because you are the one who forced me to go on Twitter and started a, a website for me because I wasn't interested in doing any of that. And you said, no, 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 brother, you've got to do this. And you signed up for Twitter and you made me start a website. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> well, the admiration is mutual. 
And uh, continuing on that theme, congratulations on the new book, The New Rules of Aging Well. What I love about your books, and, and this piggybacks off the success of your of your uh, previous book that you had, which was also uh, with the same similar title, New Rules. Um, they're so easy to follow and you really break things down, especially for people who can feel lost and confused with all the noise. So I want to jump right in off the topic of aging well. And I want you to start off with, to set the tone for the interview, what are some of the common misunderstandings and myths that people have when it comes to the category and topic of aging? Well, probably the biggest myth that I see is that as we get older, we need less sleep. Um, And the, the truth is, as we get older, it may be harder to get good sleep. So you've got to pay more attention to it. You know, I hear this over and over in my practice that now that I'm older, you know, I, you know, I can get five or six hours sleep and I'm fine. And so that's probably the biggest myth. Um, The second biggest myth would be the idea that as you get older, you, it's normal to put on a little bit of weight to feel more aches and pains to not be as energetic um and uh just generally get sick more often and that's also a myth i mean that's a it's more of a function of decreasing functioning of the organs which is going to happen to a certain extent as we get older but you don't have to have aches and pains you don't have to put on weight you don't have to feel more lethargic so all these things that we just consider as normal aging is not normal aging. It's normal decreasing function, but that's not necessarily normal aging. Yeah. You start your preface off and the book off by saying, in my medical practice, there's something I see again and again, patients in their forties and fifties who feel as if they've been betrayed by their bodies. You know, that term betrayed, um, it's very interesting because I know you have, you're very deep rooted in the Western world, you know, you're a medical doctor, you've gone through that training, but you also have this background in Eastern medicine and and being a Chinese medicine practitioner and in the world of acupuncture. And in the Eastern world, there's almost this celebration of age and the aging process. Why don't you think we have that here in the Western world? Yeah, that's a great point. It's exactly what happens. I think um, getting older and wiser is much more revered in the East. I think, you know, in the West, we have this youth culture where, you know, looking pretty, being young and, and, and looking youthful is much more admired. You know, who knows why? TV, advertising, selling products, uh, all important. Wisdom. And uh, the wisdom that comes with age is not really appreciated in the West as much as it is in the East, which is pretty sad. Um, you know, we, we and I think the other part is is this lack of community or, you know, in, in most older cultures, um, grandparents and older people are always sort of an extended part of a family. Over here, we're much more separated and distant and it, you know that that sense of family and community is is a less of a factor here in the West. And you know when you're around older people and you listen to their stories and you get more of their wisdom, you're going to appreciate them more. So I, I, you know I think it's there are many factors, but uh, it definitely is a Western thing. This lack of appreciation of um, people getting older and the wisdom that they bring to the table. You know, the subtitle of the book is called A Simple Program for Immune Resilience, Strength, and Vitality. On the topic of immune resilience, and you know, you address the pan you address pandemics in general inside the book. One of the other contrasts that we're seeing right now between the East and the West is that in America, you know, we're so afraid of aging and we so push aging away because aging has a negative association with Alzheimer's and all these chronic diseases, and it seems very scary and obesity. And when we look at the pandemic today, especially if you compare, like, let's say the US with China, you know, China's obesity rate, I believe, when I last looked at the stats, was like less than 3%. It's like 2%. But in the US, 
obesity rates are upwards of 40 percent that are there. So it almost seems that in these uh, Eastern traditions, even though they have their own challenges in some ways, one of the factors that plays into not fearing death is the integration of wellness in the the society. Although that seems to be changing a little bit as they start to modernize just like us. Right. I think you're right. It is changing slowly, but I think there's a, a an absolute correlation between how poorly we've done in the West, in particular America and England, for instance, um, and how the the consequences of COVID seem to be much worse in unhealthier societies than they are in healthier societies. So yes, there's a correlation with obesity, heart disease, diabetes, um, lack of certain nutrients, and poorer outcomes in COVID and poorer immune responses. So it's all connected. You know, actually, how immune resilience got into the head and how it got into the book. You know, I'd been asked to write a book on aging, and then COVID happened, and they asked me, "Well, can we add a page or two or three on, you know, you know, strengthening or modulating your immune system?" And you know, I told them it's it's actually the same thing. You know, when we're talking about you know, I don't want to boost the immune system, but I want to strengthen or, or help modulate, make a more effective immune system. The same tips or the same advice I give to age well is is the same advice I give to to strengthen one's immune system or to help a, to 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 have a well modulated immune system so it doesn't overreact or underreact. Because as you get older. As functions decrease, the immune system is one of the, those functions that doesn't work as well, but it doesn't mean that you can't strengthen it and you can't make it more effective. So that's why we added the immune part in, because to me, it's the same thing. The same tips that I give for aging well, whether it's sleep, decreasing sugar and on and on, are the same tips I would give to, to strengthen one's immunity. Yeah, it's not like there's one diet that's right for your brain, but then not right for your heart. In your exactly. point of view, it's all connected. Uh, Frank, let's take this a little bit more personal. You share in the opening of the book about sort of your awakening into your aging journey. So on the topic of aging, when did you start to really pay attention to this and even make some of the tweaks that you talk about uh, inside of the book that we'll be breaking down? Well, I think there are a number. I think it probably started a long time ago when I thought I was a healthy integrative doctor and I was recommending lots of whole grains and I was eating uh, sort of like a pescatarian diet and then I did my blood work and I found out that I was pre-diabetic. Um, you know, I subsequently have discovered that I have all the wrong genes. I have the genes for heart disease and Alzheimer's and diabetes and you name it, terrible genes. But um, it was then, probably around when I met you or maybe just before that, I changed my diet and I became more paleo-oriented or I cut back radically on the sugar. I'd always been a sugar addict. I started eating much less sugar um, yes, I increased my animal protein, which I think was appropriate at the time then, and my diabetes, my pre-diabetes reversed and I lost weight and I felt so much better. And then as I sort of moved on and started fairly recently in the last year or two or three, started doing more research into food and the aging process, and I started reading about the longevity genes you know, the mTOR, the mechanistic target of rapamycin being the prim, prim, you know, one of the primary ones. And, you know, the research showed that animal protein actually boosts that particular longevity gene, which you don't want to boost as you get older. You actually want to have it as low as possible or, or you want to decrease it. And so I started cutting back on my animal protein and increasing my plant protein. So not that I don't eat animal protein anymore, but I've sort of modified my diet and I think that's the you know my my wellness protocol or what I, I felt was good for me when I was younger um, maybe helped then but I realized that you've got to adapt with age I don't do such hardcore exercise anymore 
um, my exercise is more gentle because I don't want to injure myself. Um, I pay much more attention to my sleep now. I still try to eat as little sugar as possible, but I've cut back on my animal protein. So I think, you know, as you probably are aware of, you know, as we get older, we adjust. To, you know, there's not one way for everyone and there's not one way for every age group. I think everyone's a little bit different. And as we get older, we need to adjust how we do things. You know, when up to probably the age of 40, 45, you're about becoming strong and creating and um, proliferating and making kids, etc. And you need different things then and different diets, maybe even different supplements. But once you get to the age of 45 and 50, it's more about maintenance. It's not about growth anymore. So you adjust accordingly and your diet changes, your supplement regime changes, your exercise changes a bit. And I think sleep becomes even more important to, to one's regime. So there's a few things that you mentioned there that I'd like to unpack. And the, the good thing about this book that I like is that, you know, I turned 38 this year, but one thing that I see amongst my friends, uh, you know, wh whether, whatever age they are, but especially a lot of my friends that are, are in their thirties, even those folks are thinking about aging in the future because so much of what you talk about and other individuals we've had on this podcast is that, especially when it comes to things like Alzheimer's and and uh, muscle, and when it comes to things like uh, our, our blood sugar and how that impacts our health, these are habits and trends that start in your 30s, 40s. You know, you don't have to wait till you are 50, 60, 70 to start talking about aging. You can start thinking about it even at an early age. So I want to go back in time to you being uh, finding out through getting blood work done that you were in the pre diabetic category. I'm always surprised and uh, surprised and also not surprised how many people who eat clean find themselves in a place where there is so much sugar in their diet that's mm -hmm. raising their overall level of glucose and blood sugar in their body. So you probably, you were in the wellness world. You weren't eating a lot of sugar. Yep. So what was part of your diet then that was contributing you to become more, be, be in this pre-diabetic category? So because I have genetic a genetic predisposition to it, I was eating tons of fruit. You know, I grew up in South Africa and fruit was, you know, a, a major part of our diets. Um, not realizing that, you know, lots of fruit was um, probably a problem. So I was eating tons of fruit. I was eating tons of grains. I was sort of, not sort of, I was a pescatarian. I wasn't eating any meat. Um, I was pescatarian. I was juicing a lot. And when I was juicing, I was using carrots and apples, you know, to make it sweet and not really, you know, thinking that this juice was healthy for me because it was nutrient dense and I was getting a rush of these good nutrients. So without realizing it, I mean, obviously I should have realized it, but until I had my bloods done, um, I didn't realize how much sugar this, you know, I, I was eating because it all adds up. It's not that you can't have any fruit, you know, or, or any grains. Maybe some of, some people can't, but it was the amount of grains, the amount of sugar, the amount of fruit juice, all of this adding up. And then on top of it, you know, I, lo I love, you know, I would like some chocolate for dessert or something for dessert. So, um, so it all added up. And, uh, you know, when I actually looked at all the carbs that I was eating, it was obviously too much because when I cut back on it, you know, the, the beauty of changing your diet, it actually works quite quickly. Uh, within weeks, I had, you know, I, I couldn't believe, you know, I, I had puffiness that I didn't even realize I had until it went. I had a bit of a belly, which I thought was normal, which went. Um, and then you, you know, my numbers returned to, to normal after a couple of months. So the beauty of changing your diet is that it happens fairly quickly. And I think what a lot of people don't realize, and I didn't realize that, is a lot of foods that I thought were healthy, like tons of fruit, and in particular fruit juice, and not that I was having that much fruit juice. When you added that up with all the grains I was eating, um, just didn't work well for my particular body type and my genes. You know, whereas someone like you, Drew, probably you could eat more, 
fruit and grains and not have a problem. So everyone's different. You know, my wife's a perfect example. She can have many more grains and fruit than I can. She doesn't have a problem with her blood sugar. So everyone is a little bit different. But, you know, when you mix that environment, that diet with my genes, it just wasn't a good fit. Yeah. And on that topic of, of, of genes, obviously, you know, people can work with a good functional medicine doctor, see practitioners at like the 1111 Wellness Center or other places to really personalize it. But are there any uh, tools that are out there that you like that you would re recommend to the audience if they want to go down the rabbit hole of seeing what genes they have and what predispositions might be there? Absolutely. I'll, I'll, you know, I've tried a, a number of these uh, genetic tests genetic tests in my practice. And the one we use now, which I love, is called the 3X4, 3X4 Genetics. It's actually developed by a functional medicine practitioner, actually a South African woman, but it's um, now available in America. And it actually is different and I think better than the other gene tests because it actually tells you how these you know, it measures hundreds of genes and then w tells you how they work together and how you predispose to whether it's inflammation or detox pathways that are weak or um, sort of um, cardiac and vascular problems or um, c cellular um, <clears throat> cellular defects so it's actually a, a really interesting uh, test if you combine it with you know a good history and some lab work so i do that almost not routinely but you know it depends on on where people are at but it costs i think it costs about 250 or 270 bucks that all depends on what people are prepared to pay but i find that in conjunction with people's blood results, in conjunction with a good history and, and what's going on in their lives, is really helpful to make targeted recommendations for what's going to help you the most. No, that's a great recommendation. And, you know, my background is South Asian and being Indian background, yep. we are predisposed to insulin resistance and other things. We don't yep. handle certain carbohydrates as well. And knowing that, I've done a few episodes on this, but I, uh, I got a continuous glucose monitor because I've had other members uh, of my yep. family in that pre-diabetic category. And I knew that I was making changes. But again, like you said, it's the healthy things. It's I'm not eating sugar. You know, occasionally I would put a little bit of honey in my coffee, but I'm not adding sugar to what I have. It's the built-in impact of certain things. Like, for example, I love the company Siete. They make incredible products, yep. right? Yep. The Siete Me wraps, yep. they taste love great, it. the chips. And I found that the frequency that I was eating them, they spiked my blood sugar more than anything else I was having. Now, I'm not drinking Coca-Cola. I'm not out there eating a ton of sugar. So again, remember, it's relative for me, but cassava flour has yep. the same impact as, yep. as if I was you know, drinking something that had sugar in it. It would spike up my blood sugar up to like 150, you know somewhere around there. And again, that's something that's healthy. It's gluten-free. It's And it doesn't mean that I can't have it. It just means that we could be more aware of how these things impact our sugar the same as sugar. Great. Excellent point. Excellent point. And I do feel continuous blood glucose monitors are the future. I think we're all probably going to be using them because my limited experience with it has been that people like you will eat foods that they would never have thought would spike their blood glucose and it spikes their blood glucose. So I've seen that. I'm seeing that more and more often and often sometimes even protein, which I would never have thought. I mean, I had a guy the other day having a whey protein shake in the morning and he's, you know, he couldn't believe it, but he kept on checking it. And sure enough, every time he had his whey protein shake, it spiked his sugar, whereas someone else will do the same thing and it won't. So, you know, this, um, the self-monitoring, I think, is extremely helping, so, helpful. So I think in addition to the genetic and the blood test and, and a good history, self-monitoring is extremely powerful and can be extremely helpful. Now, there's a caveat that also makes people a little bit or can make people neurotic too. So one just has to be careful. You know, sure, I'll wear my aura ring and I think self-monitoring can be helpful, but some people it makes them a little bit too neurotic. So um, I think 
continuous blood glucose monitor is the way of the future. And I think, you know, mon self monitoring in general is, is going to be part of the wave of this next model of medicine where you're combining all of this together and coming up with a plan. Yeah, it's so true. It's so true. I'm, I'm using a company called Levels. It's not an ad. I haven't been paid yeah. by them. But Frank, if you ever want to try one out, yeah. I'll have them send you one. And uh, Yes, I would love it. Yes. Someone yeah. just, just told me about it. Yes. So I think that that looks very interesting. Yes. Yeah. It's really the software they've developed. But anyway, yep. getting back to our podcast here, there are so many things in aging that really you've put the lens of functional medicine on aging. And functional medicine is all about all about personalization, you know, finding out what works for you, just like you sharing about the genetics test and also commenting that certain people might be affected by certain foods and other people a little less so. But there are universal themes based yep. on our evolutionary history. And one of those themes that gets a lot of love in your book is fasting. It's uh, actually one of the yep. first principles mentioned in this category called the essentials. So tell us why fasting got mentioned first before we jump into anything else. Well, um, fasting to me now is probably one of the most powerful drugs you could use to optimize your metabolic health. You know, we are, you know, I was never a, a major fan of fasting per se, or I never realized um, how powerful fasting was. I always thought that, you know, and I was taught by my Chinese medicine teacher um, to basically eat dinner earlier and breakfast later, which is sort of intermittent fasting. But their concept or their understanding was it rests the digestive system. So I always thought of this longer period between dinner and breakfast as one that actually just rests the digestive system and doesn't have these other powerful metabolic effects. But subsequently, we found out that time-restricted eating or lengthening this time period between your last meal and, and your first meal, you know, from you know from 12 hours to 14 hours to 16 hours and, and maybe even longer, has powerful metabolic effects from controlling your blood sugar to improving heart um, um, heart disease risk factors to stimulating a process called autophagy, with which is your body's self-cleansing mechanisms. Um, and actually affecting these longevity genes in a positive way. So it has so many positive effects on your metabolism and your metabolic health that is probably one of the most powerful anti-aging things, tools you can use. Now, you know, you know, a lot of people say, well, you've got to be careful if you're a young woman, you've got to watch your hormones. Yeah, I, I agree. It may not be for everyone, especially if you're younger and if you're uh, – a serious athlete and, and you need more food or you're pregnant or you're breastfeeding like you know my daughter there's no way she could be fasting now while she's breastfeeding I mean she eats so much when she's feeding two people but as a general rule as you get older and especially once you get into 45 50 fasting is probably the most powerful um tool you can have to to age well now i'm not saying you can't use it when you're younger especially if you want to lose some weight improve your metabolic health in general um uh, even improve your energy and cognitive function i mean i know this is podcast is is sort of <clears throat> related to brain health in fasting you know another positive aspect of fasting is it can really make you think clearer and can be very powerful for brain health. So, uh, you know, fasting to me is probably one of the most, if not the most important thing one can do as one gets older to improve how you age. Frank, for your life right now, how does fasting show up? And I'll give a little bit of context to why I'm asking that. In in the tradition that I grew up in, in the Hindu Vedic tradition, even though I don't identify as Hindu, that's kind of the tradition that I grew up in, fasting was woven into the culture just like it's woven into Chinese medicine and many other ancient traditions that are out there. But fasting was always approached or sort of talked about by my grandparents and great grandparents and even my parents as typically something that was done for like skipping. When they did it, they would usually prefer to skip dinner and have yep. breakfast. They would always focus on not skipping breakfast because having the energy for the day or whatever it might be. How is it in Chinese medicine and, and how have you adopted it for where you are right now in life? 
brilliant question because this is the, the this <laughs> this is the dilemma or um, the, the the way I've adapted it and the way I make it easier for people is to skip to to have dinner earlier and breakfast later. So basically, skip breakfast. But uh, so you're still getting your, your good 16 hours um, fast, and uh, you're still eating your calories within that six or eight hour period. Now, and you're still obviously getting some effects uh, of this autophagy and all the effects that I've talked about. But ideally, you should probably be skipping dinner because if you look at the, the rhythm, um, and I think rhythms are important. If you look at the rhythm of digestion, your your digestive digestive rhythm peaks at lunchtime and then starts slowing down. So ideally, I think that way of actually not skipping breakfast, eating breakfast and lunch and skipping dinner is probably for ones you know to be to sort of get in sync with with your body rhythms is probably a better way of doing it than the one that we tend to recommend for convenience in our culture. So that's interesting that you, you say that because that probably is a better way of doing it. I tend not to recommend it unless people do that anyway because it's so much easier just to skip breakfast, you know, because most of us will – it's easy just to have a cup of black coffee or a cup of coffee with some just some fat, some, let's say, you know, unsweetened almond milk. We can talk about why that may be all right. That's easier, but it's probably better to do what you were talking about and skip dinner and, and not breakfast. Yeah. And like you said, it's like people trying to do their best in the context of the world that we're in, especially in the city that you lived in. You live in, in New York. Right. And I used to live in as well. You know, you skipping dinner is tough because it's a social thing. It's how you meet people. But I have found during the pandemic, I have gone back to some of these, you know, things and traditions, even as we are approaching into winter, I've been sleeping a lot earlier because my social schedule living here in Los Angeles is just not as active and doing a lot of the recommendations that my grandparents and great grandparents would talk about. And I've switched fasting to dinner time. And I just feel for myself personally, again, everybody's different. I feel better. My glucose as I'm monitoring throughout the day is doing much better uh, than if I would have skipped in the morning and then eaten late at night and then I'm or eating later in the evening when I have sometimes carbohydrates that are a little bit harder for my body to burn through and process, which keeps my blood sugar high. Yeah, it makes perfect sense. Yeah, I think that um, uh, I think I must try that now myself. But uh, I think that makes perfect sense to the way I see the body. And it's good to hear you say that. And I should monitor it myself. But, you know, for convenience, I just tell people to skip breakfast because it's so much easier. People actually don't really have a hard time skipping breakfast. Yeah, I think it would be harder to skip dinner, but I think I would guess you're probably right and it's better for your body. And I'm sure you're right. I'm sure it is like that because it definitely makes sense, you know, because your digestion starts going in the morning and peaks at lunchtime and then peters off. So if you can follow – your eating cycle with that that make it would make perfect sense yes and you know you know my my teaching has always been or what i found always helpful is listening to the wisdom of a lot of these ancient cultures and trying to combine com, combine it with what we've learned from science so that would fit right into my philosophy so Thank you for pushing me to explore that even further. Because in my gut, I know that makes sense and it's probably true. I'm just too lazy to do it. (laughs) Well, that's the human behavior of it all. And again, like you say, you know, you have to approach aging with a sense of joy, fun, and humor, right? You can't be so serious about this topic. And I think part of not being serious about the topic is. I mean, you could take something seriously, but still laugh about it. And I think a big part of that is not beating yourself up. You know, Frank, I see so so much self-criticism these days, especially when people start to get a little bit of knowledge and go down the space of listening to podcasts and reading books. It, It seems that sometimes people have this background sense of being very hard on themselves, which would seem anti to 
beautiful aging. What are your thoughts about that? Any tips you have for people who lean towards beating themselves up as they're listening to this interview and they hear the tips and suggestions, which could be great things they could add into their life. They maybe only are focusing on what they're doing wrong. Right. So two things you brought up. The first thing is you need to laugh more and laugh at yourself. I mean, aging you know, it's normal. Yeah, I can't do what I used to do. And, you know, uh, this is just normal. Um, so it's important to be able to laugh at yourself and, and, and the whole aging process. I think that's really important and laughing and not take yourself so seriously and not beat yourself up. Absolutely. I think that's important whether you're aging or not. Beating yourself up is not helpful. You know, you know, what I always, you know, learning to forgive, but not only forgive others, but forgiving yourself is so important. And that's why I'm always a little bit wary of self-monitoring, you know, because my experience has been for some people, the self-monitoring makes it, they get so neurotic and start beating themselves up if they didn't, didn't get two hours of deep sleep or... Um, they weren't perfect with their diet or, um, you know, with their exercise, they didn't do enough of high intensity interval training. So I think one has to be very aware of where your head's at. And, you know, as you get older, I think it does get easier. You get wiser and you sort of relax a little bit more about these things. Um, but I think it does depend on one's personality. And the worst thing one can do is beat oneself up. I think. That's huge. You know, we talk about for aging, you know, eating less sugar and getting sleep and exercising. But these non-tangible aspects of our lives, you know, the ordinary things we do on a daily basis, you know, being kind to others and and yourself, um, being kind to the planet, having gratitude, um, being able to forgive yourself and others, uh, you know, listening to music, spending time in nature. These intangible factors have a huge impact on how well we age. So, yes, um, not being hard on yourself, I think, is just as important as not eating a lot of sugar. Mm. Well said. Uh, I want to switch topics into another category um, and pick up on one of the themes you just mentioned. You know, you talk about the ancient traditions and and some of the things that they've observed in the America, especially, but now in the Western world, fitness has become a big craze, right? And it has yep. had many positive benefits with people getting into strength training um, or starting to really think about working out and how they feel in their body. But you say that there might be some lessons to learn from the Eastern traditions when it comes to movement. So as we start to think about aging, And as we start to think about what's best for us, how should we look at physical activity and how much is too little and how much is too much? Another great question, but I suppose from you, Drew, I I expect great questions. Anyway, so I would start off with a generalization to say we in the West are too much of a yang culture. We push and we push and we push. There's not enough yin. And that and, and I would extrapolate that to exercise as well. You know, exercise is you're pushing yourself as hard as you can, and um, you're not rela- You know, you're not getting enough rest. And you know, just for for anyone who pushes himself, you know, if you're pushing yourself, for instance, and you're not sleeping properly at night, sleep is when a lot of that exercise actually the, the effects sort of you know are, are, are happening in your body. So. Uh, if you look at, and then then if you look at yoga, if you look at um, a lot of the Eastern way of exercise, if you look at yoga, you know, it's push, 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 and then relax. Um, and I think combining the yang with the yin is is really helpful. So it's fine to push yourself, but then you need to balance that out with rest. And, you know, what they're finding for the, the best way to exercise for, for from an aging perspective is high intensity interval training or these sh- short bursts of exercise. So a really good way of exercising is a little short burst and then letting your body recover. Short burst, letting your body recover. And if you look at a yoga class, that is often what actually happens. So um, 
two things to be aware of. As you get older, don't push yourself to where you hurt yourself because it's, it takes more time to recover and to, to respond to an injury. If you injure yourself, it takes more time to heal. So that's the first thing. And you don't need to push yourself that hard. But if you do push, it's like a short burst followed by a period of recovery. So um, um, and, and if you look at, you know, I talked a little bit about the rhythms and how important rhythms are and digestive rhythms. You know, our body has rhythms. And I think to exercise and to live your life in some type of rhythm and not push, 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 that's very helpful to the aging process and just to, to general health. For you personally, how is your movement journey and exercise journey how is it look today, and maybe how has that changed compared to ten years ago, if at all? Well, I used to do more yoga until I broke my wrist coming off my bike. I got very much, you know, we have a place in the country, and so I ride around a lot. And I came off my bike and I broke my wrist a couple of years ago, and since then I haven't really done much yoga. But now um, what I do is, you know do some restorative yoga, but now I ride my bike still, obviously. Um, I I move as much as I can throughout the day. So I'm pretty active. I walk around a lot. I don't push my body. Even when I'm riding, I'll do little, I'll do, you know, high intensity intervals while I'm riding. You know, I also have a peloton. So I'm, I'm not obsessed, but I do exercise a fair amount, but I'll do these short bursts followed by relaxing. So I ride more. I don't run uh, because of my gammy knees, um, but I move a lot. I do high intensity interval training. And the one thing I don't do is enough of weights and strength training and which, um, you know, that I'm 66 becomes more and more important. I think strength training, apart from helping you with, with sugar, uh, maintenance is actually important for muscle mass because one of the big things as we age we start losing muscles muscle mass especially as we get older so i'm going to have to start being a good boy and incorporating some of my strength training <clears throat> techniques but i think i would like to get more into I mean, yoga changed my life i did yoga for a good 20 years i think and it really you know taught me meditation it was it made a significant impact on my health. Um, I just haven't done it for the last couple of years because of my wrist, but um, probably should get back into yoga a bit, but definitely need to get back into strength training. But I don't, I'm not, you know, when I used to go to the gym and, and push myself in the earlier days when I was young, I don't do that anymore. And I just feel great without having to do that. Yeah. Again, back to this personalization of tools in the toolbox. There's a lot of different components that are available. And then the natural ebbs and flows with life. We have an injury. Yeah. We have a loss in our family. People go through a divorce. So we're constantly going through a place where something that worked great before no longer does. Exactly. But the beautiful thing is, is that when you dip into the essentials, when you get good sleep, when you have, uh, when you're watching the sugar in your diet, you know, when, when you are overall paying attention to these areas, when one falls off, quote unquote, right? When one doesn't get as much attention, you're still doing great. Your body's still in a great place. Exactly. And I think that's one of the strong lessons inside of the book. Right. No, exactly. I think and good habits beget good habits, you know. It's sort of sort of routine for me now to wake up in the morning and meditate. Almost most days I'll do it. And if I'm... Even if I wake up very early and not that it's ideal, I even start meditating in bed before I get out of bed. So, you know, these little things become habits. I try and ride my bike at least three, four, sometimes five times a week. You know, with a, the Peloton does make it easier. Um, and I'm not promoting Peloton. I'm just any any exercise in your, you know, the mirror, whatever you can do in your home is good. But just moving your body around. So, um I think making all these things habits is important because, you know, the brain loves habit when it becomes automatic and you don't have to think about it, uh, then it becomes so much easier. Yeah, it's so true. You know, on the topic of strength training, I, you know, grew up with Indian parents who 
played sports. Actually, my dad played professional cricket for the uh, the country of Kenya when I was uh, first born and then retired. He was a, a baller in cricket, if anybody knows or familiar yeah. with the terms. Uh, yeah. But but strength training and exercise outside of sports was not really part of their culture. You know, and my dad and my mom, who are very smart and now are very active, growing up, we sat a lot. We studied a lot. It was the importance was focused on sort of books and doing a good yep. job where other families grew up in the culture and tradition of working out, hiking, things like that, that wasn't part of it. So I got into strength training much later and I just realized I needed a personal trainer because that was going to keep me accountable. And then when the pandemic and everything got shut down and still in California, unfortunately, which is crazy, gyms are still closed. You can't go to a gym. And so that wasn't really an option anymore. So You know, even I had to pivot and figure out, okay, what else can I do that even if it's not perfect can just become a regular part of my routine that I can integrate and good enough sometimes is good enough to just continue to make progress. Exactly. Exactly. Well said. Frank, I want to pivot here because anytime you talk about aging, people are always curious about the best, the newest, the latest when it comes to therapies, when it comes to supplementation, things like that. And I think overall, a lot of those things are very exciting and the future is very exciting, the stuff that and the research that's happening in these categories. But in general, I think that sometimes they get more attention than they deserve when people aren't focused on the essentials. And that's what you talk about in your book, is that really focus on the essentials. Then once you got that, there's a few things that are exciting that are out there. So can you talk about some of the, um, let's first go into therapeutics, right? What are some of the therapeutics or new modalities that people could potentially explore and think about adding in when it comes to the topic of aging well? Right. So I think if people understand this concept of hormesis, which means uh, a a little bit of stress is actually good for your body. So we all know that chronic stress, long-term stress, bad for your body. But a little bit of stress is actually powerful because it actually activates the longevity genes in a positive way. So what are short bursts of of stress? We talked about fasting. That's a little bit of a stress on your body. And and your body responds in a way that is is positive for the aging process. The other um, hormesis um, aspect is high intensive interval training or short bursts of of exercise, another little hormetic stress. And the one that I think is really powerful that everyone can do is extreme temperatures. You know, everyone knows about Wim Hof now um, and sitting in the ice and breathing. But going from a sauna, for instance, to a cold tub or just going from a very hot shower to, you know, putting on the ice cold shower afterwards for half a minute, uh, these Extreme temperature changes can be very powerful. So, you know, once again, most cultures have had aspects of this in their culture from swimming in freezing lakes in the middle of winter to saunas. Um, But I do think, you know, an easy way to incorporate it if you can't go into a sauna or to go into an ice bath is to just turn on the ice cold shower after a hot shower. So that's, I think, can be a very powerful tool. Um, I think there are uh, a couple of supplements that I think are important as you know and and as you point out most important are the you know cutting back on sugar um, fasting sleep exercise and we can talk about diet in a little while but there are some supplements that seem to activate some of these longevity pathways and work with them in a way that can be conducive to healthy aging. You know, one of the most exciting, you know, there there are a couple of that people know about curcumin, which obviously you've talked about for, for as an anti-inflammatory, but it has many different effects in the body, which are really positive for aging. Resveratrol, uh, to quercetin, I'm a huge fan of quercetin. Quercetin is one of those um, supplements. You know, you do get it in foods, but not that much in foods. But in this day and age, I think quercetin, because it has antiviral activity, um, also has anti-aging activity or affects these pathways in a a positive way. 
Um, it's anti-inflammatory as well. And then lastly, nicotinamide diriboside, NR, I think looks like it's got a lot of positive um, effects on, on the aging process. So I take all of them. I love it. And again, just like you had the genetics recommendation earlier, if people are looking to dive into that and, and sort of personalize it for where they're at, what's your recommendation? Exactly. Should they see a functional medicine doctor? Are there guides that are out there or things that help them self-navigate? How, how would you su suggest? I mean, there's great tips. First, of course, I suggest you know getting your book, but if people are looking to take it a little step further, how, are, how should they be thinking about that? Um, that's, you know, I'm not sure about 3X4 genetics, to be quite honest, if it has to be ordered by a practitioner. Um, but if you can see a functional practitioner, they definitely can, or, you know, I, I'm, to be quite honest, I should know, but I'm not sure if one can order without a practitioner because they come with a real good readout and, and suggestion. So you may, it's, it's always better to have a knowledgeable practitioner, uh, whether it's a nutritionist, a functional medicine practitioner, a naturopath. Um, um, there are some other genetic tests, which, you know, uh, we used to do 23andMe, the health version, and then just run it through some of, the, you know, some of these sites you can run it through and they give recommendations. But I do find this 3X4 by far the best of all of them. So I think that would be the one I recommend but I'm unfortunately not sure if you need a practitioner to to order it or not. Um, but you can find out. Drew, I'm not. Yeah, um, well, we'll find out and we'll link it up in the show notes so that we can recommend make recommendations. And yeah, there's some great genetic reports out there. We really like one by Rhonda Patrick. Um, yes, she, she a, right. So that's what I used to do. We used to do the 23andMe and just run it through Rhonda Patrick's site. Mm -hmm, well, that, mm -hmm. It's a little bit complicated. She doesn't make things easy, but that's a pretty good one. Yes. Great. Well, we'll look up the one that you mentioned and we will make note in the show notes, whether you need a practitioner to order it or if you can order it on your own, which is always uh, exciting. Frank, I want to pivot into something that I feel is at the root of so many challenges that we're going through, especially again in the Western world. You know, in the Eastern world, there's a deep prioritization of elders. And with yep. that also comes family. Now that doesn't come without consequences. You know, many of my friends and cousins inside of that live in India still, it's more traditional. If they want to do something that's different, let's say everybody in their family is a doctor and they want to go and be a musician, that's still very taboo. It's almost like I heard Hassan Minaj, who's a comedian one time say, there's two questions, there's two things in life that your parents, especially if you're Indian or South Asian believe uh, that are two things that are too important for you to decide on your own, which is who you should marry and what you should do, right? So like, <laughs> like your profession. And that's unfortunate, right? So while there's also good that's there in the East, also it comes with some limiting challenges too. But that being said, one of the aspects that I do feel they have knocked uh, knocked down well, they do a good job in the East, is on the topic of sort of friendships and community. And inside of your book, you have this whole section on tribe. And loneliness is growing so much here in the Western world and at rates that seem to be increasing every year. So why is finding your tribe so important to the aging process? And what are your recommendations on actually how to move forward with it? Right. So you know, first of all, that's a great point. You know, there are more and more studies showing the negative consequences of loneliness and on, in particular on the aging process, but even in, in younger people. So loneliness is a huge issue that seems to be a new Western, a relatively new Western phenomenon. It's just from the way we live. You know, in the old days, everyone was surrounded by family and community. It was uh, much harder. Now, and, and made worse by COVID, you know, everyone you know, everyone's sort of living their own, you know, the individual is 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 more pro promoted. Everyone's on their computers. And although there are, you know, whether it's Facebook and, and what other communities that people can create on online, which I don't think is a bad idea, there's less of the social interaction and community-oriented um, <coughs> Or, or community in general in our culture. And, and that's, you know, I'm not, a, when it comes to 
religion. I'm not um, a dogma you know, of any of the traditions. I, I think the good part of religion, um, you know, if it can be spiritual, is great, but has been community building. So I think that's probably been the most important aspect of many religions is the aspect of you feeling part of a community. Uh, so I think, uh, you know, it's starting to sort of reemerge as an important factor, this aspect of community. And, uh, and, and your generation, I mean, is doing it probably better than my generation. But what I tell people, just find something that you love. You know, it's easier when you're a parent because you tend to you find community with your kids' schools and, and parents and school and and the and the um, neighborhood can become a community. Um, but find you know something that you love doing, and there's always community. Not always, but most of the time, there are communities around a lot of these hobbies and sports and projects it's really important to be around people who see you for who you are where you feel comfortable saying exactly what you want um who you know will be there for you when you need them um you know it's interesting uh i found you know as a immigrant coming from south africa um i noticed in a lot of places much less so in new york but in a lot of places where a lot of South Africans went, you know, they spread all over the world. And, you know, there's good and bad, as you pointed out in, in the way you grew up, but the community that got created when people left their, their villages and towns in South Africa, and this is probably most cultures and, and, and many immigrants, and they, wherever they went, they created a, a very strong little tight-knit community. And I think that's extremely powerful i mean i've seen it happen in in many different cultures um, when people come from other places where community is much stronger and they come to america where community is not strong they tend to create some type of community with the people people um are sort of similar or they feel they're similar to where they came from whether that's true or not is another story but i think that community aspect is extremely powerful and extremely important as we get older. You know, when you feel like someone's got your back, when you feel that, you know, when you have to go somewhere and there's someone to look after you, um, it's very powerful. I mean, it's very, um, it's, I think, an essential aspect of, of life, which we sort of started losing here. I mean, I get the sense that it's coming back a little bit, um, but it's slow. You know, with you being from South Africa, I think there's a word and a philosophy. I guess it's really a philosophy of life. Yep. Uh, a lot of listeners of our, ours don't know it. I wonder if you could explain it. And it's the word sure. Ubuntu. Ubuntu. Right. So Ubuntu is something that means what makes us human is a humanity we show each other. And I learned about Ubuntu when I went to work in the bush in South Africa. This is the early 80s. And um, it was something that you know if if here i was going into the bush and it was during apartheid and here i was this white doctor in these black communities but everyone wherever you know and i was fascinated by the culture but whenever i would go you know we would have to go into um on, on these sandy dusty roads into the middle of nowhere wherever I, wherever i would go and they never knew me they would everyone would ask you in for you know to sit around the table even if they didn't have any food they would you know bring you in as part of the, the community and i noticed there that ubuntu now listen everyone's as you pointed out in india nothing is perfect but there was this feeling that you know everyone was part of the community and you you, you need to look after the community and I still see that um, and, uh, as many as South Africa has so many problems still. When you go, you know, I work with a nonprofit actually called Ubuntu Pathways, it used to be called the Ubuntu Fund. When I go into the communities there, there's that sense that um, we're all in this together. Um, and, uh, you know, if you're hungry, I'm hungry. And I think that is, that's more, you know, that's, Every culture has it. Almost all the old cultures have it. They have a different name for it, you know, whether it's uh, um, 
you know, from the Buddhist culture, you know, with compassion or every culture has a name and, and has a sense of Ubuntu. They just call it diff something different. But if you go to any of, you know, I've noticed whenever, because I love going to, to places, you know, sort of unexplored places, wherever you go, you see the same sort of feeling in these cultures that have not been what we would call civilized you know, or West, you know, civilized in a Western way. And there's a sense of Ubuntu in that culture. And I think it's very powerful. And it's one of the biggest things I think we've lost in, in our Western culture and probably one of the most important things as well. Hmm. You know, in, in closing and kind of on that topic, I feel like one of the beautiful and also challenging things is when you're in the same village with people, which is evolutionarily how we all grew up. Yep. And let's say you have a falling out with somebody. Well, eventually you have to get over it or you're sort of forced to deal with it because you are in the same community together, right? Yep. It's, it's a lot harder to maintain a grudge on somebody because you have to see them regularly, or at least you're dealing with other people who have a vested interest in the community and are telling you, look, that was years ago, just forgiven, forget, or, you know, deal with it. Um, letting yeah. go of grudges is one of the things in your book that you talk about. Again, it's not just about diet and supplementation and cutting sugar. It's also about the mindset that we bring. Why did you include that specific recommendation of letting go of grudges in, in the book? Because I think it's extremely powerful. And I mean, and South Africa is a perfect example of that. You know, when Nelson Mandela came out of prison and he walked out of prison and he saw his prison guard behind the fence and some, some anger started building up inside of him. And he said at that moment, if he doesn't forgive that person, he'll still remain, you know, he'll still be a prisoner. He may be out of his cell, but he'll be a prisoner in his own head. So, I mean, that was very powerful. And then the whole uh, commission that Bishop Tutu was in charge of, the rehabilitation, um, what's it called? Um, I can't remember exactly. But, you know, it was part of the process of letting go of, being angry at the apartheid system, which is almost impossible to do, and they actually managed to do it in, in a big way. So I think forgiveness, if you don't forgive someone else, you become a prisoner of that anger and that hatred. So learning to forgive is extremely powerful and extremely difficult to do. I'm not saying this is easy, but if you can learn to forgive um, and let go of grudges, that's you know, once again, one of those intangible um, habits, or it's not really a habit, but one of those intangible things one can do that's extremely powerful and really good for your health. On a practical level, you know, we all have ups and downs. We've all had things that have maybe not worked out well or things that have gone awry or miscommunications. Have there been any tools or coaches or books that have been helpful for you to guide you down that process of stepping into forgiveness and letting go of grudge? Well, it's very difficult. First of all, I'm not saying this is <laughs> something that's easy to do. It's something that I've struggled with too. I think as I get older, it becomes easier, um, but still a struggle. Um, Bishop Tutu has a book on uh, I can't remember the name. Um, there are a couple of books. It's, um, you know, I haven't, I can't say there's a tool um, that, that I personally um, can recommend. Or uh, well, even if it's uh, been, you know, how, how do you navigate it? Do you talk well, about these grudges with your friends and say, this is what I'm hung up on. Do you have a trusted person in your life you go to? Yeah. Um, yeah. Yep. Yeah. So my trusted person is my wife, who's been my wife for what she's, or 40 years, actually. It's 40 years this year. Um, in fact, in a couple of weeks, we will be, have been married for 41 years. Um, so yes, she is my trusted advisor. Um, I always go back to the Nelson Mandela quote and um, and uh, thinking about that because 
you know, listen, I, I have held too many grudges in my life. There's no question about it. And you realize when you keep realizing that the, the prisoner or if you don't forgive someone else, if you hold on to grudges, you're the one who suffers, not that person. Um, and I think just remembering that over and over again, it just makes it easier to forgive. Um, you know, not that I'm still, I'm, I'm, not that I'm perfect in this regard, but I'm definitely better than I was even a couple of years ago. Um, maybe as you get older, have a grandchild, things change. Um, I'm not sure what it is, to be quite honest. I don't even know. I'm, I'm definitely not someone that I would turn to for advice on this, um, except that it's true. You feel much more freer. When you learn to forgive, you feel free um, because you're not holding on to that grudge. I mean, people don't realize when you for, if you don't forgive or when you forgive, you, you're letting go. There's so much in yourself that you're freeing up. You're freeing yourself more than you're freeing that other person. So I think um, forgiveness is extremely powerful. Yes, it's very difficult, but it's extremely powerful and extremely freeing. Mm, it's so true. You know, and I think it's uh, worthwhile even to have the intention. If people aren't even sure how to get started, sometimes just even having the intention because I truly believe that when you feel that there's an area of your life that you want to work on and you hold it in your heart as an intention or even say it out loud, like, you know what? I don't have the strength right now to forgive this person, but I want to, and I'm putting out there to whether it's God or the universe or, or whoever, I'm looking for signs on how to navigate this process. I often find that those signs come to you. They may not come right away, but they eventually come. Something that's been very helpful for me in this process is there's an author that I've quoted on this podcast before. Her name is Byron Katie. And she has a methodology and process called The Work. And she's written a book uh, called, I don't love the title, but it's actually an incredible book. It's called, I Need Your Love, Is That True? And in that process, she walks you through these works, which is all about just questioning your beliefs. But whether it's that or just holding on to an intention, you know, it's as, as you said, Frank, it's those grudges that will only end up eating us up inside and taking away from the joy and beauty in our lives. Right. No, I like that a lot. And, and I, I can confirm just from never mind myself, but in patience, I see if you don't let go of something, it festers. You need, it's, it's so important to let go of these grudges because they fester. Um, and, you know, when you realize that you're the one suffering more than the person you're holding the grudge on, it, it's, it actually is quite freeing. And when you experience that, then it makes it easier to let go of other grudges. But I do like, you know, the the, the idea of holding an intention or having an intention first to start the process. Yeah. Sometimes when we feel like we're not strong enough, at least we can hold the intention and hold it inside of us that we want to make progress on an area. Frank, this has been a great conversation. There's so much more inside of the book that we won't be able to get a chance to touch on right now. Uh, but I also want to keep some surprises for folks, including different therapies and things that people can do if they really want to supercharge their approach to wellness, even deeper recommendations of supplementation. And uh, you talking a little bit about also your routines that are there, which I know people are always interested in. But Frank, I want to take it back to the beginning and address this sort of doubt that often people have in their minds. And I know one of the doubts or the concerns or call it even a myth or a falsehood that we tell ourselves is it's too late to start. There's people that are listening to this podcast right now that are like, these things all sound great, but it's too late for me to get started. What do you want to say to those individuals who believe that? It's never too late. I mean, there are more and more studies coming out now that people in their 60s and 70s and even in their 80s, when they make some changes, they get positive effects. That's never too late. I mean, there are even studies of, of uh, people in their 80s making lifestyle changes and seeing the positive benefits. So my answer is it's never too late. And, you know, what's interesting is once you start making one change, then it's easier to make the next change and then the next change. So um, you, you, not only will you feel better, but you'll want to make more and more changes. 
So the R says it's never too late um, and never too early at the same time. You can start, you know, putting in these changes to feel more, to feel stronger and more vital when you're younger. But it's even when you're 60, 70, even in your 80s, you can make these changes and, and you see the results. And the beauty is you actually see the results fairly quickly. It's not that you have to wait months and months to see the effects of these lifestyle changes. You actually see them, you know, within weeks, sometimes within days. Mm, it's so true. Frank, the book is out. It's well designed and it also feels good. It really feels good in your hand. I'm holding a copy yeah. with me right now. The New Rules of Aging Well, a simple program for immune resilience, strength, and vitality. Please go out and get it today. We have the link in the show notes. If you want to support the podcast, support it by getting the book of the author, Dr. Frank Lemon, that we just had on. Frank, in addition to the book, and we'll have the link for it again in the podcast uh, show notes for anyone who wants to click in it and buy it, where else do you want to send our listeners who want to keep in touch with you? Just to drfranklipman.com, drfranklipman.com. I have a weekly newsletter. Uh, I'm also on Twitter and a little bit on Instagram, not much. But because of you, Drew, I have a a website and a newsletter, <laughs> which is all free, and, and and Twitter and Facebook. So thank you for everything that you've done to make me a little bit more um, sort of staying with the times, let's say, not just writing books and doing my thing, sort of trying to get the information out there via the web. So thank you. So people can get hold of me at drfranklipman.com. Yeah, I love it. Frank, you're awesome and you continue to put out fantastic, digestible. I think that's really the key. There's a lot of books out there, but there's only a few that are really digestible that really simply just cut and get into it and remove a lot of the fluff. And this is another book that's there. So thank you for all your work, Frank, that you're doing out there in the world. I appreciate you, brother. And thank you, Drew. Lovely, lovely to speak to you after all these years. 